It's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting. Welcome to It's So Interesting, where people talk about their work and life experience. I am George Spitzer. Welcome to It's So Interesting. I have a special guest with me today, Catherine R. Hammond, an author, but she calls herself Kate. We'd like her to tell me the story of how she started this book, what the title of the book is, of the fascinating tale of how you uncovered some of the original source material. So tell me, Kate. Um, it all began nine years ago. The name of the book? The book is called Island of Peace in an Ocean of Unrest, the Letters of Dorothy von Moltke. It all began nine years ago when I was doing some reference work for a museum in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts called Long Year Museum about the life of Mary Baker Eddy and the early workers in the church. I was doing the reference work in the church periodicals. Now, and which church is this? The Church of Christ Scientist. Which is also called Christian Science. Christian Science Church, right, okay. right, yeah. I was looking through the periodicals in this work. I ran across the name Helmut von Moltke. And I'm going to interrupt you again. You're saying Moltke the way it's supposed to be said. Yes. But how do you spell it? Oh, O M O L T K E. And it's pronounced? Moltke. Okay. Regular Americans would pronounce it? Moltke. Moltke or yeah, Moltke. Moltke. If you're from New York, it would be Moltke. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I ran across the name, and I, I had taken some history courses in high school where I remembered that where we ran across the name Helmut von Moltke was this great field marshal under Bismarck and Wilhelm I, who was the general that led the Prussian forces in victory over the French in the Franco-Prussian War, which they won in 1871. And I recognized the name, and I, it was the same name as this Moltke that I was finding in the periodicals, not only the last name, but the first name. The, the Christian scientist was named Helmut von Moltke, too, the same name as the field marshal. So I, I was kind of intrigued by this. Of course, as most people would do, I went on the Internet, started surfing around and see what I could learn about these people. I, there's a great deal about the von Moltkes on the Internet because of the famous general who was born in 1800 and died in 19, 1891. But he, he had a nephew also named Helmut von Moltke. If, a lot I'm, not, of, if I'm not mistaken, there are a lot of Hel is a family tradition in Germany at that class of people that they all have the same first name. The variable is the middle name. Right, that's right, yeah. So like, and, there must be, what, ten generations of Helmut von Molkes. Well, I think it really began with the field marshal, and they, they wanted to perpetuate... I, I believe that what they wanted to do is perpetuate the glory of this great general yeah. through, the, through the next generations. And what I learned was that this great general had a nephew also named Helmut von Molke who was the chief of the general staff under Wilhelm II during World War I. He's the Kaiser. The, the Kaiser, Kaiser. The Kaiser, the Kaiser right. Wilhelm II. So you have Kaiser Wilhelm I and the, and the first great field marshal, and then you have the next generation, the nephew, who was had the same position vis-a-vis -vis the Kaiser, but it was, a, it was another Wilhelm, Wilhelm II. Then, of course, he became the Kaiser of Germany. Then he had a nephew named... Helmut von Moltke. So it's a, yet another generation. Now, the reason these names went from the original one of the born in 1800 to nephews is that the great field marshal had no children. He was married to a woman of English descent, as it happens, and, uh, but they had, and it was a very happy marriage, but they had no children. So the name went to his nephew, and then it went from there to another, uh, his grandnephew, the Christian scientist, who was born in 1876. It's quite an intriguing story. So, so I, I read up about these people. It turns out that he uh, had, a, had a wonderful healing in 1899 and from then on became a Christian scientist. Now, three years later, in 1902, a mother and daughter from South Africa took a tour of Europe, and they went to Dresden. And in Dresden, they were looking at a newspaper, and they saw an advertisement for paying guests on an aristocratic country estate in Silesia. And the only requirement was a good hand at bridge. Now, oh, I'm going to interrupt you. Oh. Where is Silesia? Yeah, Silesia is actually the easternmost part of Germany, one of the easternmost parts of Germany, kind of in the middle, but to the east. 
and it's uh, it was part of Germany, and the capital was Breslau. After at the end of World War II, that area became part of Poland. They moved the boundaries, and so Poland actually got quite a big chunk of Germany, and then and of course in the eastern part of Poland was ceded to Russia. That was the deal uh, at the end of World War II. So, but at this time Silesia was part of Germany. And so they, this this mother and daughter, their name was Rose Innes. Uh, the last name was Rose Innes, Jesse Rose Innes, and her daughter Dorothy, who was then 18. Prominent as Helmut von Wolke's family was, so was Dorothy's, because her father was a big player in South African history. He was a trained lawyer, was very active in the South African government and the formation of the South African Union. He was a great friend of Jan Smuts. Uh, he was attorney general under Cecil Rhodes, and then in uh, nine, and he was knighted in 1902, hence the name Sir James Rose Innes. In uh, 1914, he became chief justice of South Africa, and he was not only chief justice in the sense of being uh, eminent position in, in, in the legal system, but he was an outstanding chief justice and an early advocate of the rights of blacks, which really, which they called natives at that time. I think it really derived from his passionate sense of justice. This man had a really deep, profound love of justice, and I think he could see that some of these people, a lot of these people were not getting a fair deal. Um, so in 1902, that was the year that they met, Dorothy went back to South Africa, but in 1905 they were reunited. It all came about when Helmut von Wolke's father died in 1905, early in 1905, and uh, he became the new Count von Moltke because it's, it's inherited and he was the eldest son. So he became the new Count. Suddenly he really needed a wife to run the estate, to run the... And it was a large estate, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. It was several miles by several miles. Yeah. Had uh, 60 or 80 or 100 employees. They Basically. had 60 regular workmen yeah. on the estate, and then in, in, in uh, peak times they had more people come in and help. And the estate was just much, almost the old medieval model, particularly in Germany, yeah. where the, the town was named after the estate, and the villagers were pretty much all the employees of yeah, the estate. Yeah, Kreisau is a, actually a, is a village, and mm -hmm. uh, so they had a sense of responsibility for these people, and the main house on the estate, which they call a Schloss, which literally means palace or castle in German, was actually a large manor house, like a chateau in France. So he needed a wife, and he was, you know, he loved this woman, and so he heard that she was actually visiting in England. This was three years after he had met her, and so he rushed over with his sister, one of his sisters accompanied him, and he went to England and uh, asked for her hand in marriage, and she accepted. And so that that fall, in October of 1905, they were married in Pretoria, South Africa. And then they came back to, to uh, Silesia, to Germany. And uh, so then, then they had five children. They raised a, f a family of five children, four sons and a daughter. Well, what's unusual, after I read this book, was nowadays you would have called them among the one percenters, mm -hmm. uh, the, the aristocracy of Germany. Everybody knew everybody at that level. fact is, they got married in the middle of the Edwardian period. Life was the way it was set up. They had this estate. They had the idyllic life. They sure did. <laughs> and um, they, in these letters, which I'd like you to talk about, uh, yeah. she describes about the moonlit rides through the snow outside of Breslau. And then she was writing letters about how things started happening to go bad, such as yeah. World War I, yeah. the Treaty of Versailles and its, its effects, the Depression, the run-up with Hitler. Here she is, a Britisher, married to a German count, but she loved her parents. Mm. So she wrote letters on a regular basis throughout right. these years yeah. to them in English. Yes. And that's what I believe is so special about this book. We have no interpretation here, and she happens to have written very well, yes. <clears throat> described the political situation, seemed to, seemed to be a very good observer of that, I guess because of her father's training. So tell me a bit about a little bit of her life up to World War I, and I think she's had some kids by then. Well, yeah. She had her first son, Helmut James, in 1907. They, they appeared every two years. Mm -hmm. It was a two-year interval. 
the next son was 1909, and then 1911, 1913. You mean methodical. Yeah, right. And then the, and then the fifth child was a daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sons had nice names. Helmut James was named for Sir James Rose Innes, and also his father, another Helmut. He always kept the Helmut in the family, and, it, and actually her grandson is named Helmut, but I'll talk about him later. So the second son was named uh, Jovo, which is short for Joachim Wolfgang. The third son is Willow, which is short for Wilhelm Vigo. And the fourth son was Karl Berndt, which is actually the name of the great field marshal. His name was Karl Bernhardt, I think. The, so this boy was named Karl Berndt, which is similar. And they called him CB. And then the daughter was, uh, was named Asta, Asta Maria, whom they called Asta. So th there was a wonderful family. It was a very happy family. She was a, a very, very loving mother, very caring, very... Uh, she just enjoyed her children. She had a, a great appreciation for their individuality and a great respect, I think, for them as individuals. And also, she had a great sense of humor. I mean, she was a deeply serious woman, but she had a she was a very funny lady. I, I, I get a lot of fun reading her letters. And you got all this from just reading the letters, or yes. about other books about her, or her serious writing, or is this you got to know her just because of the letters? Well, primarily through the yeah. letters, but also I met her daughter-in-law because, well, now I should tell you the rest of the this interesting story about my getting to know this family. So um, before I even knew these letters were available. They, they were actually were not available because they've never been published before. This is the first time the letters have been published in English. And uh, although they were actually translated into German about, I guess, about uh, 15 years ago. So what happened was I found out when I went on the internet, I found out that two of her daughters-in-law lived in Cambridge. Uh, now, the, the one of them... Massachusetts. Cambridge, Massachusetts, right. Okay. Uh, the, I have to backtrack a little bit. Uh, her eldest son, Helmut James von Molke, uh, was a brilliant uh, student, a brilliant lawyer, and had aspirations, I think, to go into law and politics. But when the Nazi, he was born in 1907, so when the Nazi period was heating up, uh, the family were very anti-Nazi, anti and he ref absolutely refused to join the Nazi party. And this meant that he couldn't really advance in in the career of law but he and in fact he was drafted by the German Abwehr which is the defense in the intelligence part department because having an English speaking mother and also having this connection with Christian science uh, he the family knew a lot of Americans and English Christian scientists and other other people who were not necessarily Christian scientists so I think the Nazi government wanted to exploit this uh, opportunity but but the family were anti-Nazi, and he used this position actually to help people get out of Germany, a, a, a number of Jewish people and other people who were um, threatened. One of them was a man named Otto Keep, and he, he knew he was going to be arrested, and he, he tipped him off. Well, somebody blabbed about this at a cocktail party, and a Gestapo officer was standing nearby, and so he was arrested. And then that was who, in... Who was arrested? Helmut James okay. was arrested, and that was in... Uh, early in uh, 1944, and then in July of 44, when Klaus von Stauffenberg attempted uh, this, uh, to kill Hitler, you know, he, was, he brought a bomb into the conference room where Hitler was in a place called Wolfschanz, which means Wolf's Lair. Uh, there's been a lot about it. Tom Cruise made a film a few years ago called Valkyrie about this plot, which failed because the bomb did not kill Hitler. There was a for various reasons, but one of them was that somebody put the briefcase that contained the bombs underneath the table, and it didn't. It, did, it only scratched Hitler. He had minor injuries. Well, the result of this was that virtually, well, about 500 people connected with the German resistance, all those who were opposed to Nazism, were rounded up, and about 200 of them were executed, and including actually the head of the Abwehr, a man named Canaris, who who, who was also anti-Nazi and a number of other generals and anti-Nazi people. Well, one of the people that they that was connected with von Stauffenberg, knew von Stauffenberg, because they were all part of this German resistance, was Helmut James von Moltke. And he was already in prison because of being found out for having tipped off Otto Keep. I think there's more to it than that, because he also headed up 
what is called the Kreisau Circle. Yeah, that, that was the other thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah he had he ran a, a, a group called the Kreisau Circle, obviously named for the estate, because they they had some of their meetings at the estate in Silesia. They also met in Berlin. This was all during World War II. And what was the purpose of the meetings? And they were they were planning for what they uh, for what Germany would be like after what they hoped and expected would be the downfall of the Third Reich, of the Nazi government. And they were planning for a non-militaristic democratic Germany, and they were kind of laying the plans for this. So meanwhile, he, in 1931, I'm backtracking a little bit, but 1931, he'd married a woman named Freya Deichmann from a prominent banking family in Cologne. And she was a very loyal wife to him, and they, were, they had this tremendous correspondence, even while he was in prison, well, uh, what I discovered on the Internet was that this lady was still alive. She was 94 and living in Norwich, Vermont, near Dartmouth College across the river. Is that when she revealed to you that there were letters in English? Yes. We got, we got talking about the letters, and I mentioned that I'd looked at the book, uh, Ein Leben in, it's called in, Ein Leben in Deutschland, which means A Life in Germany, the letters of Dorothy von Molke. She said, oh, she said, that's so difficult to read in German. You should read them in the English. And I said, well, yeah, but where are they? And she said, well, she, would, she didn't seem to ha have a clear idea of how I could get these letters. Uh, but she said, you really need to, to read, read them in the original English. It's too much work to, to translate everything from the German. Well, what, what, I went back to Cambridge, drove back to Cambridge, and uh, about a month later, I got a postcard, a card from her, and it said, "Dear Mrs. Hammond, your uh, the letters have arrived. They're, they're uh, car uh, uh, photocopies of the original letters, and actually, they had just been sent by the estate of the woman who had translated the letters from English into German. And so, when she died, all these original, uh, all these copies that she had been using for her book were sent to Freya. So I was a beneficiary of that." And, and she had stacks of them. There were these towers of, of plastic boxes. I guess that's the way Germans store things like that. They have these plastic boxes. It was very, it was perfect. It was, it was very well organized. And, and uh, I mean, there were about several, three or four towers, you know, <laughs> four, four feet high. And uh, so she said, well, you're welcome to come and, and look at these letters, read them letters, and do your research. And so I, I thanked her and... Uh, made another appointment. I, I, I made several trips. For the next six months, I made several trips to Norwich. I actually stayed at a nearby inn. Actually, they offered to let me stay at their house, but I, I didn't want to intrude on their privacy. So I stayed at this little inn in the neighborhood about a mile from their house. And, you know, it was a, it was a really special experience because she just was so helpful in answering my questions. Um, she would, she, she, we would have lunch together. she go out in the kitchen and get soup and salad and bread and sausage and whatnot. And I'd say, you know, can't I help you with the dishes or, you know, can I do anything? She said, no, 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 I'll do all this. And this lady is 94. You would, you would, you would never guess her age. <clears throat> she was very, very lively, and uh, she would bring me tea while I was studying the letters. And anyway, I had my uh, t laptop, which I borrowed from the uh, museum, and I was taking notes on the letters. So I, that was about, for about six months I did that. And they also allowed me to bring the copies back to Boston so I could work there, which I appreciated. I, they were very trusting. That's one of the things that has impressed me about this family, how very trusting they have been throughout this entire project. They weren't, you know, trying to control what I did or, you know, they just had faith that I would do what. And you didn't, since the letters were in English, you didn't need to translate them. Right. But at the same time, I presume... Uh, having read the book, that you had to read them all, and out of that extract pertinent passages, yeah. you then introduce them with your narrative so you can tie it into a story. Yes. So it's not just a book full of letters. That's correct. Freya actually get to read your manuscript before she passed? Yes. Uh, well, I finished the manuscript, and it, t it turned out to be quite a long piece, but uh, I showed it to her and also to her son. His name is Helmut Kasper von Molke. Did she, say, did she have anything to say about this? Uh, she, yes. I mean, I, well, did she I was, say, I, was I don't want you to publish the book, don't let anyone see it, or no, no. <laughs> get involved in changing everything? Uh, on the she... contrary. She never did that, and she, she seemed to like it. She said, this is very simple but beautiful. And I said, well, you know, I, I feel a really warm rapport with Dorothy. I feel a kind of spiritual connection with her. And she said, oh, yes, I can see that. 
you know, they, they, she said, you, she said, that's very good what you've done. She said, it's, you, you build bridges between the letters. She, I think she thought that was an effective way of presenting them. And so, in a sense, I'm telling the story of this family through the letters, through Dorothy's own words, with my own matrix, you might say. I was thinking, as, as I read the book, that the first part, or part one, are the letters, which is an incredibly detailed and fascinating perspective of life in Germany through this tumultuous first half of the 20th century. Yes. It goes into how she brought up her kids as a mother, all the things she did with the villagers, the political observations, the work that her husband did, and so forth. We can't describe everything that goes in the book, or this interview would be way too long. Yeah. But they had tough times during the Depression yeah, and during the time. Weimar years. Yeah. They almost lost their estate. Yeah. World War II pretty much finished it off when the Russians came in. Yeah. From a point of view of an <clears throat> academic or a historian reading this book one, that was fascinating. But what I've never seen in a book before was your part two, which mm. in this case is about Christian science. Yes was pervasive, of course, in their entire life, because to them that was one of the most important aspects of their life, which dictated how they brought up their kids, how they took their political stands. Not that the Christian science church had any stands, especially in Germany, but her understanding of the religion and her husband's understanding of the religion were in, was intense. And from a historian's point of view, it provides the deep background to how this family functioned. Most times you, you, when you read biographies and histories and so forth, you hear about what they've done, how successful they were in life, or whatever mm -hmm. the happenstances were, but you never got into the engine underneath the family mm -hmm. that actually explained why. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are lots of families with many religious backgrounds, which if you actually dug in there, you'll find out this person was a very deep-believing Catholic and did his actions because of that and we only see the effects of his political act activities. Mm -hmm. This book turns it around, because once you read the actual narrative that you wrote and the extracts of the letters, that's fascinating unto itself. Then in book two, it goes into, well, what made this family tick? Yeah. It, where she writes as a mother, any mother can understand how she felt about sure. their young babies and their kids and what they wished them to be, mm -hmm. and you captured that. Now her husband, you know, he stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Nazi organization. This is in the 30s when they were doing their run-up. He was able, I understand, to not fly the swastika on his estate. They did not. Tell me about that. How did he get away with that? Well, they, they didn't. They, the family were anti-Nazi. Anti so they did not fly the swastika, which was brave of them, really, because it was, it was, you were legally obligated to. And they had a, they had a manager named Zoimer, or Zoimer, actually, he, he was actually quite pro-Nazi, but he was also very loyal to the von Moltkes. They, and he did actually fly it on his, from his house. They did not fly it from, from the Schloss. Well, this sounds all very fascinating, and I hope anyone listening to this broadcast would very much want to get a copy of this book, which, by the way, can only be gotten by direct order through a website, www.dorothyvonmoltke.com. That's V O N M O L T K E dot com. This is George Spitzer, your host from It's So Interesting dot com. Thank you, Kate, for taking the time to talk with us about this. It's so interesting. 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 It's so interesting.